Hello, my friends. We are live for the second installment out of four of the first four chapters of The Crescent Stone, read to you live by me, yours truly, Matt Michelotis, the author. Uh, today, hi, Chandra. Today, we'll be picking up in chapter two, but I should probably fill you in on what happened in chapter one first. Uh, the book, for those of you who haven't seen it, hey, Melinda, hi, Andrea, uh, is The Crescent Stone. You can see it on, see, look, I cleverly also placed it behind me on the bookshelf. <laughs> so, chapter two. Uh, in chapter one, what's happened so far is we've been introduced to the main character, uh, Madeline Oliver, who is a 17-year-old high school student who uh, who has a lung disease that causes it to be difficult for her to breathe. In the first chapter, she went out into a garden behind her home, uh, and her breathing made it difficult for her to do anything other than just lay there uh, and try to keep living. When she was approached by a strange woman who came apparently out of nowhere in this giant garden in her backyard, who came and sat down and offered to make her a deal where in exchange for uh, pieces of garbage, basically, that she would give her three wishes, uh, three favors, uh, and as well as some advice. And at the end of the chapter, uh, Madeline passes out right as her mother and one of their uh, domestic workers comes out to find her in the garden. So we will begin with chapter two, which is titled Darius. One thing I love, by the way, about this book, I don't know if you can see this clearly here, Mm, the design work they did is so beautiful. Look at the top of the chapter there. Uh, and there's the little epigraph. But they uh, they made it all to match the top of the book there, where you see the crescent stone sends out the, the rays. So here we go. Chapter 2, the crescent stone. Chapter 2, Darius. Uh, and there's an epigraph at the beginning of each chapter from people of the Sunlight Lands, one of their uh, various people groups. So this comes from a, uh, a story called Ronaldo the Wise from the Skim people. And the saying is, love comes hand in hand with joy. So here we go. Chapter two, Darius. Madeline used to sing. In fact, she was lead soprano in the school choir last year, her junior year. She used to dance, ballet, contemporary, hip-hop, swing. She used to drive down the road with her friends, all of them shouting over one another, laughing at each other. She used to run track, her specialty being the marathon runs, where she could pace herself and feel her legs moving like pistons, her arms like pendulums, her whole body like the gears of a clock, ticking off the seconds to the finish line with precision. She had gone to state last year, she used to drive herself to school. She used to walk upstairs to her bedroom without stopping to catch her breath, clinging to the banister like a sea star suction cup to a black rock. She used to be able to breathe. I arranged your ride to school today, Mom said, her voice making it clear this was a final decision. Madeline had used a similar tone of voice when her parents tried to get her to stop going to class. Stay home, they said. You're too sick, they said. But when she did stay home, her parents didn't. Dad had to work, mom had activities, and Madeline ended up in bed, hacking her lungs out, sweating through her sheets, lonely and miserable. Her mom took a cup of steaming coffee from Sophia and leaned against the kitchen counter, brushing an invisible speck of lint from her ice-blue athletic top. I thought you would take me, Madeline said. She had taken her inhaler 15 minutes before, and for the next 30 minutes or so, she would be able to breathe with relative ease. It was like pushing water in and out of her lungs, but at least the air moved. Sophia had made pancakes this morning, Madeline's favorite. Madeline had barely touched them. Like it or not, she wasn't well, and the thought of trying to rally the energy to pretend she was, while her friends drove her to school blaring music and trying to cheer her up, she didn't want that today. A silent, uncomfortable ride with her mom would be better. I have badminton this morning. Of course. Mom wore her badminton skirt, her platinum hair pushed back just so with a white headband. I can set up my own rides then. It's not far for Ruby. 
Her mother raised her eyebrows. It's 15 minutes out of her way. I texted Darius. Mom, it's not right the way you've been avoiding him. Why the sudden concern for Darius? Mom tapped her nails against her mug, taking another sip before saying, you dated the boy for over a year and then dropped him without an explanation. He deserves better than that. Without an explanation? Who told you that? People talk, Madeline. Your friends were worried and they mentioned it to me, poor boy. He was always good for you. You should spend more time with him. You don't even like him. Mom shook her head. Not true. Oh yeah? Then why the big sit down in the living room before prom? Mom's lips pressed together, making fine lines branch along her mouth. She always did that when she was done with a conversation. He'll be here in 10 minutes. She blew on her coffee and shook her head. I'll see you after school. As her mother walked from the room, Madeline shouted, Dad's exact words were, he won't provide for you the way you're accustomed to. If that was meant to convey approval, I missed it. She hadn't raised her voice like that in a while, and it cracked, followed by a deep-chested cough. She put her hands flat on the counter and tried to relax. Sophia put a hot mug in front of Madeline. Steam infused with lemon and honey wafted to her. Sophia's gentle hand brushed her shoulder. For your breathing, she said, and then she was off cleaning the breakfast dishes. Thank you, Madeline muttered. Sophia had a way of smoothing everything over in this house. The drink was warm and soothing, and Madeline told herself it worked, but reflecting on the conversation with her mom made her angry. There was no way one of her friends had told her mom anything about the breakup. Most of her friends barely checked on her now. It was hard to be friends with the dying girl. Oh, they responded to texts, most of them did anyway, but she couldn't imagine any of them sitting down with her mom to talk about Madeline's dating life or lack thereof. What did her mom know about Darius anyway, next to nothing? Madeline had dated him for over a year and her mom hadn't shown a moment's interest. Now she was setting up a carpool with him. Whatever she was up to, it was infuriating. Madeline's backpack was by the door. Probably also Sophia's doing. Everyone treated her like an invalid, which she basically was, but it still made her angry. Her mom made her angry. Embracing reality made her angry. She should stay home. That was reality. She shouldn't wander in the garden alone. That was reality. She shouldn't have a boyfriend. That was reality. It wasn't fair to Darius to ask him to walk this road with her. It wasn't fair to keep him tied to her like an anchor. Breaking up with him had been an act of love, a way to set him free from her illness. And now her mom was trying to undo that. She waited by the door so Darius wouldn't have an excuse to come in. His beat up black Mustang pulled into the driveway and he jumped out to come get her at the door. He moved like an ice skater, the ground rolling away beneath him like a moving walkway. Today he wore jeans and a button-down shirt with his letterman's jacket tossed over it. She knew that button shirt was for her. She had told him on their first date that wearing something other than a t-shirt might show he was at least a little bit excited. She had met Darius in track. He was beautiful with dark skin and an angular face. He kept his hair short. She could tell he had probably shaved it the night before, and when he smiled, it was like the sun rising. That wasn't the reason she had started dating him, though. It was because of the day she'd turn her ankle during track, and he had noticed and turned back for her. She'd told him to keep running. It was no big deal. She was all right. He'd told them they were a team, and he needed a breather anyway. He'd walk beside her, and he got her back to the coach, stayed there while they put on the ice, made sure she was okay, checked in with her the next day. And after that, he was checking in on her every day. It started with the ankle, but from there he wanted to know how she was doing in class, with her parents, her friends, with life in general. And pretty soon they were texting, calling, laughing deep into each other's lives. She asked him about his cousin Malik, who was away at college. Darius helped her think through how to respond to her parents when they were being difficult. And when her breathing trouble started and her mom took her to the doctor, Darius offered to come. Madeline's mom said no, that it wasn't right for a stranger to come to a doctor's appointment. And anyway, it was probably just a little infection. But when she and her mom came out into the hospital parking lot after the appointment, Darius was leaning against his car, reading a book, his cell phone in hand. He grinned and put his phone to his ear, call me. Saying goodbye had been hard. It was the right thing to do, but it was impossible. And now here he was on her front porch beaming. 
He reached for her backpack. Madeline flinched away. I'm not broken. She winced. She hadn't meant to come across like that, but seeing him here, there was a gravity there, a desire to come back together, and she couldn't allow that. It would be too hard on him, too painful for her. I know, he said, and bowed with a flourish, but I am a gentleman. She smiled despite herself. She debated for a moment, then unslung her bag and let him carry it. How's your breathing? He asked once they were settled in the Mustang and he was backing toward the road. Terrible. How did mom get your number? He shrugged. How does your mom always get whatever she wants? Called the principal, maybe. He tapped his hands against the driver's wheel. Listen, has your mom told you she's been calling me the last month or so? What? No? He raised a hand. Don't be mad. She's just worried. Ever since you, uh, uh, since we broke up. He glanced at her, then back to the road. Worried that you've given up? Madeline watched the neighborhood spin past. Her parents had made it clear they didn't like Darius. What they hadn't made clear was why. Dad said he wouldn't make enough money, but that was years away. And what did he know? She and Darius were getting the same education, after all. He had grades nearly as good as hers. And if she wasn't in honors classes, his GPA might even be higher than hers. She didn't know if it was because they were both 17 or because Darius was black or because he was at her private high school on a scholarship, but something about him didn't meet mom and dad's approval. And now mom was texting him to check up on her. She gritted her teeth. Mom would hear about this when she got home. And worried that she had given up? She hadn't given up. She was embracing reality. That was part of the stages of terminal disease, right? She had gone through denial, through anger. Well, maybe not all the way through. Now she was approaching acceptance. There was nothing more to be done. No more treatments. No miracle cures. She was walking a path her parents could go, couldn't go down. Not really. She was alone. And no one else needed to suffer this with her, not her parents, not her friends, and certainly not Darius. She turned his radio up and kept it loud until they got to school. Darius, without even asking, pulled up alongside her classroom instead of parking in the lot. So she wouldn't have to walk so far, of course. She didn't know how to explain to him how infuriating she found his thoughtfulness, especially when she was already mad at him. She knew it wasn't his fault. Everything made her angry, and she knew he wouldn't understand it if she tried to explain. The car chugged to a stop, and the radio fell silent. Darius stared out the windshield. She knew that look. He was gathering his thoughts, trying to find words. She put her hand on the door handle, but despite herself, she paused. She missed hearing his voice, missed talking about life, about things that mattered. Maddie, he said. She melted a little at that. She had missed hearing the way he said her name. I got you something. He held a package wrapped in brown paper. He'd never been great at wrapping gifts, and this one was no exception. Too much paper, crookedly cut, with tape all over it, and an, and an attempt at a bow made with twine. It was obviously a book. She couldn't take a gift, though. It wasn't fair to him, or to her, really. Darius, I bought it before we broke up, but it just got here, shipped from England. She didn't say anything. I know you're going to love this, and I want you to have it. He held it out. When she took it, their fingers brushed against each other. Madeline pulled the tape loose and slid the book out. Darius, I can't believe this. It was a copy of her favorite book, The Griffin Under the Stairs by Mary Patricia Wall. It was the first of the Tales of Masselia, a series of children's fantasy novels. The final novel had never come out, so it wasn't as popular as other series and not as easy to find, but Madeline loved it best. Darius had never read the Massalia books until Madeline got sick. He had come to her house, sat on the floor while she curled on the couch, and read aloud the whole series, a couple chapters at a time. It had taken months to get to the end. She had loved seeing the books through his eyes, listening to him talk about them, hearing his thoughts and questions and insights. First edition. Darius said proudly, hardback too. She ran her hand over the cover. It had been released in 1974, and the picture on the front was of a griffin crouched under a stairway, two children standing to the sides, stepping back in surprise. Ivy grew up around the outside of the picture, and the whole illustration had the look of a woodblock print. Her anger drained away. 
She couldn't believe it. She had always wanted a first edition, though she had never mentioned it to anyone, not even Darius. Holding it in her hand now, feeling the texture of the cover, the weight of the book, seemed almost miraculous, like maybe things that were impossible could happen. She didn't know what to say. She settled for, Darius, thank you so much. Then before the emotion choked off her words, she asked, where did you find this? He grinned. I started calling bookshops in the UK, little places that didn't put their books online. She flipped open the book, shocked by the crispness of the pages. It looks like no one has ever read this copy, she said, like it's untouched by human hands. Nah, Darius said, look at the title page. She looked from him to the book, then back at him. It couldn't be. She turned the first page, a blank one, and there it was. The name, Mary Patricia Wall, was written in a neat curved script in black ink just beneath her typeset name. Mary Patricia Wall had held this book in her hands, had put her fingers on these pages to keep them open. Tears cascaded down her face and she couldn't keep away from Darius anymore, couldn't pretend, even for his own good, that she didn't want to be with him. She let his gravity pull her in, leaning into his embrace and didn't say anything. He didn't say anything, didn't ask for anything, just wrapped his arms around her and let her cry. She cried for his thoughtfulness, for thankfulness to have someone who knew her so well, for fear of what was to come. She cried because she was angry and sad and afraid and loved and so, so tired. There was no way out, no solution to her illness, but at least there was this, a moment of loving human touch a gift from someone who knew her well. The warning bell for first period rang. The crying set off a minor coughing fit. She sat up, bracing herself on the dashboard. Darius put a comforting hand on her shoulder. When it passed, she wiped her eyes with her sleeve and slipped the book into her backpack. There must be something better. I know it in my heart, Darius said, quoting a line from the book. The main characters, siblings, Lily and Samuel, are standing at the space beneath the stairs, and the wall has fallen away, and there's a swirling of color in the space. The griffin has disappeared into it and beckons Lily and Samuel to follow. And the only impossible thing is that I would leave you. Madeline wiped her eyes again, then replied with Samuel's words, If we're together, I won't be afraid. Lily's next line was, then take my hand, Samuel, and let us see what beautiful things await. But before Darius could say it, Madeline took his hand and squeezed, and before she could stop herself or think about what it meant or what the consequences might be, she leaned toward him and kissed his cheek. She pulled away the heat from Darius's hand, familiar and comfortable. She looked into those dark brown eyes, so deep they were nearly black. It was like looking into the night sky if all the stars blinked at once. It had been weeks since she had looked at him like this and she wanted him to reach out, to touch her cheek. Instead, he opened his door and came to get her. He walked her to class, her backpack on his shoulder, his hand on the small of her back, ready to catch her if she fell. Did she look as weak as that? If you need to go home early, text me, he said. His words were so gently delivered that she didn't get angry at the suggestion she couldn't make it through the day. You're going to be late for class she said. He grinned. Impossible. Then he ran toward his classroom in that loping, long-legged stride of his, leaping like a deer over a planter so full of life and joy and breath. Your car, she gasped, shouted. He changed directions immediately, sprinting, a sheepish look on his face. I might be late to class, he yelled back, just as the bell rang again. The end of chapter two. There you go. We're two chapters in. If you would like to download and read the uh, the first four chapters, you can at thesunlitlands.com. I also put a link here for the new Facebook group, facebook.com, The Sunlit Lands. I just put that up. I think only 20 people in there so far. So you can be on the front end there. Candace says she just picked up her mail and a copy of the Crescent Stone was in there. How can that be? It's not out yet. Uh, Candace almost certainly, I'm guessing, bought it from Tyndale.com. Tyndale is the publisher, T-Y-N-D-A-L-E. 
And uh, one of the things Tyndale is doing as a little present to all my friends and supporters and fans out there is they're making the paperback version of the book, which is what I read from today, available for $5 uh, if you pre-order it, which means if you order it before August 7th. Also, if you pre-order, you can get uh, two episodes of the Sunlit Lands podcast, which will have seven or eight episodes eventually, none of which have been released, but they'll send them to you immediately, uh, as well as, hey, look, Micah's coming in. I'm actually in her room. That's why Micah's coming in. <laughs> uh, as well as a color map. So that's it for today. Tomorrow we'll pick up with chapter three and then on Friday we'll do chapter four. Any questions, thoughts, anything before we go? Oh, my pleasure, Andrea. Thanks, Chuck. Um, we're, uh, we're headed out pretty soon here to our favorite Hawaiian restaurant. But we didn't play Minecraft. We're going to play Minecraft too, don't you worry. Okay. So many things to do today. All right, my friends, thank you. Have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Now I press the end button.